Good morning, everybody. Grace and peace to you on this Lord's Day. It is a joy to see you this morning. I want to welcome you to our hour of worship together. I'm Jim Hoffman. I have the privilege of being pastor here at St. John's. I want to invite you to take a moment, if you would, real quickly. There's two things, uh, order of business. Number one is, is you find an attendance pad that's in your row. It's a little black pad. If you would just simply sign in and let us know of your presence, we would certainly appreciate you doing that. Hope that you came in this morning. You received one of our worship guides as well. For those of you present, everything that you need to participate in our order of worship is contained herein. Just simply follow along. For those of you at home, you received an email at 9 o'clock this morning inviting you to come and be in worship with us. You'll find your worship guide there, and you can sign in on that email as well. It's got a little uh, tab there that you'll be able to do that. Or you can just simply leave us a note on Facebook or at Church World Media and let us know that you were present. Not only does it have our order of worship in our guide, it also has our invitations for this week. I would encourage you to take a moment to look through it. Page number 11, you'll see our calendar for this week. A quick thing to note on it is uh, any uh, donations for Baby Grace, they are due Tuesday, so please bring those if you would please. Uh, on pages 13, 14 and beyond, you'll see the rest of our invitations, and I would encourage you to take a moment to read through all of those. A couple of things just to note, um, on sun, uh, Sunday, September 12th, we're going to have our rally day. We had talked about having a community meal, and we've actually decided to postpone that just simply for a variety of reasons, most of them being COVID and various other things, but we've just decided to postpone that. We're still going to kick off rally day, so take a moment to read that note. We'll have a children's Sunday school kick off that Sunday as well. On Sunday the 19th, we've got a couple of different things going on. We're going to have Blessing of the Backpacks and third grade Bible presentation during worship that morning. And then on the afternoon at 3, we're going to have Blessing of the Pets in, the, in Arno Park. So we're looking forward to that opportunity to reach out to our children and our neighbors as well. Continue to read through all the notes. There's a variety of different things that you'll want to participate in or be informed about. We'd encourage you to make sure that you read through each and every one of those. Today we're going to conclude our message series titled Killing Jesus, and we're going to talk about what it means for us to suppress his love in our life and in our witness. So I'm looking forward to how we can be better at that as we uh, contemplate what it means for us to live in his love. So looking forward to our conversation on that with you. As we continue in worship, I want to invite you to turn down to page number three. Our opening hymn this morning is Praise the Lord Who Reigns Above. It's United Methodist hymn number 157, and we're going to sing stanzas one, two, and three. As you are able, I'd invite you to stand and let us sing.
Director of Children's Youth and Family Ministries, and our call to worship this morning can be found on page four of your worship guide. Listen, for the voice of God comes near. Listen, for God's voice is not intrusive. We come to worship the God who became one of us. Who calls us by name. Whose love is incarnate. Who is. Let us gather together in joy and hope. Let us worship the God of love. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of praise this morning is found on page four and five of your worship guide. It is His Eye is on the Sparrow from the Faith We Sing, number 2146. <laughs>
good. It is now time for children's moments. So children and children at heart, this moment is for you. So I have a question for my children at heart this morning. It's a really hard one. What's your favorite cookie? Chocolate chip, okay. I, I had a feeling that a few people would say that one. Any others? Snickerdoodle, that's my dad's favorite. Any others? Ginger, perfect. Peanut butter, there you go. Anybody else? All of them, okay, good. Yeah, there is no such thing as a bad cookie. What is, I, I mean, I don't want to like start controversy here, but what is Milk's favorite cookie according to the slogan? Does anybody know? Oreo, there you go. So we're going to talk about Oreos this morning. <laughs> what? Trips Ahoy? <laughs> so uh, pay, according to their slogan, Oreo what is one of Milk's favorite cookies. Uh, so at our house, I was looking through our pantry and we have quite a few Oreos in our house. So my husband likes double stuffed Oreos. I kind of like my Oreos with peanut butter on the top of them. Little life hack here, if you put a little bit of peanut butter on top of it and then you dip it in the milk, it still stays crunchy. So there's a little tip for you there. My son likes the little mini Oreos. My father-in-law father -in -law likes the Oreos that are dipped in the dark chocolate, especially if they have like mint in them. And then my daughter likes the little ones that are already dipped in white chocolate. So we have a plethora of Oreos in our house. We all like Oreos, but nobody seems to like the same Oreo, it seems like. And also a fun little tip here, Oreos are actually dairy free. Did you guys know that? Oreos are dairy free. Not sugar free, but they're dairy free. <laughs> So anyway, so Oreos kind of remind me a little bit like people. Some are thin, some are double stuffed, some are mini, some are golden, some are dark chocolate, some are birthday cake, some are s'more, some are mocha, some are lemon, some are even a little cracked. And I looked it up this morning. Do you guys want to guess how many different flavors of Oreos they manufacture? 85. 85. I know. We have some work to do, folks. <laughs> So there is a little something for everybody to love. Now, all Oreos are filled with something sweet, and that filling is what helps keep them together. And that's partially why we love them. So you are what you eat, and so if you should eat something sweet, just remember that we can't make everybody happy all the time. You're not an Oreo in real life. But this week, I want us all to remember that we are all made up of a sweet center and we need to stick together. So if you come across a new type of Oreo that you're unsure about, remember that deep down we're all the same. And if you find a broken Oreo, remember broken cookies do not count for calories and that we shouldn't throw them away, but we should enjoy all that they have to offer. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for making us all unique. Thank you for loving all of us and our differences. Help us stick together in sweetness and in kindness. And in your name we pray, amen. So on pages five and six, you're going to see our joys and our concerns for this morning. I would draw your attention to those. Under our joys, thank you, Julie, for providing our cookies for today's uh, fellowship time after the worship service. And thank you, church family, for the lovely flowers that are on the altar that celebrate Margaret and I's 60th birthdays this year. We deeply appreciate your generosity. Under our concerns for this week, a couple of things just to uh, announce to you and to let you know to pray for. I pray for the family and the friends of Val Ross on her passing this week. For the family and friends of Maurice Wilson, Diane Blackwelder's brother, on his death. We moved up this week on our prayer list those impacted by natural disasters, those suffering at the hands of others in the worldwide pandemic. Those are usually way down our list, but we decided that they should be a focus for us this Sunday and then this week, and so we've moved those up so that we might draw your attention to those today and each day. And then, of course, the names that are on our list that follow are folks that we've been praying for for a period of time. We would invite you to continue to do the same, not only this morning, but each morning in your time of prayer. I'm going to invite you now to a time of private prayer. This is an opportunity for you to share with God what is on your heart and your mind today. In a few moments, I'm going to lead us in a pastoral prayer. We'll pause. If there is a name that you'd like to speak out loud, we'll give you a moment to share that name so all might hear and pray for that person today. And then I invite you to join with me as we close together in the Lord's Prayer, which you will see at the bottom of page 6 in your worship guide. So let's take a moment now to pause and to pray.
Oh, gracious and holy one, we thank you for this beautiful Sunday, which we claim as our Sabbath, our day of rest. We pray that today we might experience the renewal of your spirit as we come and give ourselves to you in the moment and in this present time. We ask that you might also grant us wholeness and healing in the places in our lives where we seek it today. We also look for your forgiveness and your mercy for where we have failed you this week. And we ask that you might set us on a right path today as we meditate upon your word and upon your presence. This is our day where we might reclaim who we are as your people. We might find ourselves in the middle of your spirit that is dwelling today and recenter ourselves on your purposes. This is our day where we might also find the rest and the renewal that we need. We have struggled and labored long this week. It's also a time where we come to just center ourselves in your presence of prayer to lift to you all that is on our hearts and our minds, our joys that we wish to share with you. For this week we have experienced many things that have been joyous. And we give you thanks for the blessings that you have given to us, for the time and the place in which we live, for all that is around us, for all that you've given us to possess, to use, and to be good stewards of. We also come in this moment to share with you our concerns. Since we lift them up to you, whatever has burdened us this week, caused us anxiety or stress, or losses that we have experienced, or moments of just doubt that we need to overcome. We lay these burdens down at your feet, O oh God, seeking the power of your spirit that might refresh us this day. Give us a new sense of your strength in our lives, the vision that you have for us and the purpose that you have called us to. We might be your loving and whole presence in the world. We might be your people that proclaim the good news of your salvation for all. That we might live in the presence of that each and every day. So on this Sabbath, we come before you, and in this hour, pray that you might speak to us in powerful and meaningful ways. There are so many things that we also are, uh, pray for that are beyond us. We pray for families that are mourning this morning, for the Ross family. For Diane and her family as they mourn loved ones who have passed. We pray, O oh God, that your peace might be there, your comfort might come, and that family and friends as they surround might remember the glorious nature of your love and grace for all, and the promise that we will be reunited with our loved ones in your time and in your place. We pray for those on the Gulf Coast that are preparing for a hurricane, we ask, O oh God, that you might watch over them and protect them. For those that are suffering at the hands of others, for our continued journey through this worldwide pandemic. We know that you are present, that you are dwelling with us, that you know our needs, our pain, our wants. Help us to lean into your spirit and into you, that we might be led and guided by you in all things. And the many others on our prayer list, their needs of body, mind, and spirit, we lift them up to you this day as we pray in the name of your Son. And now we pause to lift up any names that might be upon our hearts and minds that we wish to share now in this moment of prayer. So all these things we pray in the name of your Son, who is our Lord and Savior. 
and the one who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Today's scripture is from John chapter 19, verses 23 to 27, from the Common English Bible. It can be found on pages 7 and 8 of your worship guide. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and his sandals and divided them into four shares, one for each soldier. His shirt was seamless, woven as one piece from the top to the bottom. They said to each other, let's not tear it, let's cast lots to see who will get it. 
This was to fulfill the scripture, which was, they divided my clothes among themselves, and they cast lots for my clothing. That's what the soldiers did. Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene stood near the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the, to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Jenny. So in the mid-1970s, two guys got together and wrote a song. Their names were Hal David. He wrote the lyrics, and Albert Hammond. He wrote the music. In 1975, Hammond recorded the song as part of an album titled 99 Miles from L.A. His recording of this song didn't go anywhere. It fell flat. In 1980, Bobby Benton recorded the song and it still didn't go anywhere. In 1984, two unlikely characters joined forces and they recorded it as a duet. You music buffs, anybody got an idea who I'm talking about yet? Need a little bit more? Curious, maybe? The two characters were Julio Iglesias and Willie Nelson. Anybody got an idea now what song we're talking about? It is titled, to all the girls I've loved before. For those of you who are a little younger, you might ask your parents what that song is. At that year, in 1984, it peaked as number one on the U.S. country charts, number three on the U.S. contemporary charts, and number five on the U.S. Hot 100 charts. And believe it or not, it was subsequently recorded by other singers like Tom Jones, Merle Haggard, Engelbert Humperdinck, Alanis Morissette, and the group El Devo, among many others. It was also recorded in several languages beyond the original English and Spanish. Now, you might ask, what does that song have to do with my sermon today? And the answer is, not much. <laughs> I will tell you this, I won't be preaching on all the girls I've loved before this morning. <laughs> Actually, here's why I mentioned this song. If you think with me about this, think of all the music, literature, poetry and art that is dedicated to the theme of love. How voluminous it is in our world. I think it would be fascinating if someone would develop a museum dedicated just to the theme of love and to portray all the various art forms in that museum. But you think beyond the external view, the external words, we talk about love as an internal feeling as well. The feeling of love that we express for people around us, places, things that we profess to love. I'm a lucky man, and I know that. Margaret has put up with my shenanigans for 27 plus years. Next May, we're going to celebrate 25 years of marriage. God bless her for having as much patience as she can muster with me even today. I love her beyond measure and words. I love our kids and the families that they have built. We've got two great, uh, two great grandsons, not great grandsons, but we have two great as in an adjective to define them, grandsons that we have fun hanging out with. We've got two beautiful new little granddaughters that we are looking forward to watching them grow. We are lucky that our parents are still alive and most of our siblings are as well. We are fortunate because love abounds in our home and in our family. We also have discovered a love for travel. I, I'm fortunate because when I was in the service, I was overseas twice and as part of that, I got to travel primarily a lot through Europe and, and, the, and the Mediterranean area, so I kind of developed a love for travel. Margaret and I have developed that as well. On our 10th anniversary, we went to Paris for eight days. We've been on three cruises, primarily in the Caribbean. We've taken family vacations to Los Angeles, New York, the Keys in Florida. We've been to the mountains of Colorado together and with our family and our grandkids as well as others. We've taken Skylar to Washington, D.C. with us. We've taken some of you to the Holy Land. 
We recently, though, discovered the fun of camping in my sister-in-law's travel trailer. We've been out three years in a row with our two grandsons. We've drugged them along on this journey with us. The first year we went, we went kind of southwest. We went by the Blue Hole in Santa Rosa, New Mexico, Flagstaff, Santa Fe, Sedona, the Grand Canyon. We drove through Monument Valley, Four Corners. We went to Mesa Verde and Cortez and went to see the Pueblo Indian cave dwellings that are up on the Mesa. Our second year, we took a really long 4,000-mile trip through the Badlands, Custer State Park, Mount Rushmore, Crazy Horse, Devil's Tower, Yellowstone Glacier, and on the way home, we saw the world's largest buffalo in North Dakota. Any of you ever seen it? It's a big old statue of one, right? This year, we decided to go east. So we went to central Kentucky near the Red River Gorge area, and then we went down to Pigeon Forge in Tennessee. We drove out to the Biltmore in Asheville, North Carolina. Went to Ruby Falls down in Chattanooga, which some of you have experienced this year as well. And to top it off, our normally very quiet grandson, DJ, who's an introvert extraordinaire, got home each year and spent an hour plus telling his parents how much fun he had on our vacation, everything that he did. I think as much as he hates to admit it, I have a suspicion he actually enjoys, loves going on vacation with his nana and his papa. But here's the problem with RV traveling. It's become an issue for me because I've discovered the great American country channel and I've started watching two shows on it, Flippin' RV and Going RV. Have any of you ever seen either one of those shows? No? Oh, you ought to check it out because it's tempting. I've watched multitudes of the episodes on there. There is this lure of the open road, and it is a tempting mistress calling some of us to it. Sometimes my imagination runs a little wild with me, thinking about traveling the country in an RV, just going from campground to campground and getting an opportunity to see different parts of our nation that we have yet to visit. And so this has kind of prompted me to occasionally check out the used RV market online. Now, I'm especially inclined to what's called a Class C model, which is a drivable model, or a Super C would really be my preferred because that's the diesel version of it, at least until I see the price tag. And then I wake up from my dream and figure out that that's probably not even going to fit as a long-term goal for retirement. But nevertheless, you still think about the love of travel. Margaret and I pray that God's going to grant us a long time to be able to do that in the years yet to come. But until the day comes and I retire, I find myself still dedicated to continue to focus on one of the loves that I have, and that love is serving God and you and our community. How many of you thought I was going to say golf? Right? Nope. Wasn't going to say golf. Serving you, serving God, serving our community. Friends, I don't say these words just merely as a proposition for my sermon flow. I, I actually love serving God by serving you and being a part of what it means to serve our community. It's a high calling that often I feel unworthy to be called to. It's a joy, it's a privilege to be a part of communities of faith that are willing to join in fellowship and worship and ministry together. Your faithfulness makes it easy to lead, and your generosity makes a difference in the world around us. A colleague of mine once uh, recently said that pastors may retire, but preachers never do. Right? There's not only a calling to what we do, but there's a love that is behind it as well. Now I want you to pause and think for a moment. I know I'm not the only one that loves life and the things about life. So why don't we take a moment and shout out some things that you love as well. So one, two, three, shout it out. What is it? Oreos. Oreos. <laughs> right? Anybody else? I didn't hear you. You guys have no loves in your life whatsoever. All right. Well, then this sermon is over. No, um, you see, we all have things that we love. We may not be able to just shout them out in the moment, but they're there. There are things that we love, but I think we also realize that our love isn't perfect. Our love is incomplete in some ways, even when it comes to our love of Jesus and our love to follow Jesus. 
Now, you think about this. Not a single one of us intentionally wakes up in the morning determined to kill the love of Jesus in our lives or in our world. None of us sets out on a daily mission to do this, but in some ways we accomplish it. And I'd say it's mainly by the things that we omit. We omit the things of God from our daily routine, and because of this, we may fail to love as Jesus would have us love. We fail to follow his example in some ways. In the midst of his suffering and dying on a cross, Jesus was still able to think of others before he thought of himself. You think about this. This is seen in the instruction that he gives to the beloved disciple. Disciple, here is my mother Mary. Take her into your home. Take care of her as if she were your own mother. Mom, here is a disciple that I love and I trust the most. After I'm gone, he's going to take care of you. That's my expanded version of what Jesus said. But that's the end. Call it a divine presence, the power of the Spirit, or pure selflessness. Jesus had the capacity to think of others long before he thought of his own needs, even while he was dying. No one was ignored or omitted from his ministry. When he saw the hurting, his compassion took over, even while on the cross and dying. It was a three-hour period in history that would solidify Jesus' teaching and his example for his disciples. Because he showed them in that moment what it meant to truly love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, even to the point of giving yourself over to death. He showed them what it meant to love neighbor when he healed the lame, the sick, the blind, and the possessed, and he forgave sins. He showed them what it meant to love one another when he washed their feet during the last meal. He showed them what it meant to love your enemy when he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus' teachings and example cast a large net of love over the world, hoping that it would ensnare as many in its webbing as it could. But it didn't catch everyone. Some would hear his words and see his example and ignore it. Some chose to ignore, some chose to admit, omit his example from their lives. As much as we want to fault the Roman soldiers for Jesus' death, they cannot be our scapegoats. They were simply doing what they were instructed to do. It was their job. Execute subversives was their role, their responsibility. And we shouldn't cast aspersions upon them for gambling over Jesus' robe. It was a valuable garment. They were given permission to wager over it as part of the spoils of being on the death squad. The sad part of this story is is that the words in the example of Jesus' love could not penetrate their armor and their hearts. They deny the power of forgiveness, the power of God's love for them. They ignore it, and thus they omit it from their own lives. Some might say that they have an excuse. He wasn't their Savior. What about you and me? Do we have an excuse for omitting the words and the teachings of Jesus in our life, especially the basic command to love? We who profess to be saved by God's grace, do we have an excuse for omitting love from our lives? In 1968, Dr. Kent Keith penned what was called the Paradoxical Commandments. We read these Wednesday night in our pastor's Bible study. They're a modern form of the Beatitudes, and I want to share a couple of them with you. Here's a couple of examples. If you do good, people will accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Do good anyway. People really need help, but may attack you if you help them. Help people anyway. Give the world the best you have, and you'll get kicked in the teeth. Give the world the best you have anyway. Here's the first one that was on his list. This is the one I want you to hear. People are illogical, unreasonable, and self-centered. Love them anyway. The mandate of Jesus for anyone who would follow him is is that we love anyway. Cast aside our excuses, our reasons. We are called to love anyway. Man, if only that could be 
our reality. Over the past couple of decades, Margaret and I have gotten the flu shot nearly every single year, and that's because our primary care physician is a flu shot pusher. You're in his office, you're getting the flu shot. Boom, right then, right? Margaret and I both also got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine back in mid-March. And when the booster comes out, more than likely, we will go and get that as well. Now, while there are a couple of lingering questions that are even in the back of my mind about the vaccine, they weren't enough for me to say no to them, to not getting one. But you know what? I realize that not everyone believes the same as I do. For some of you, your worldview is simply this. Everyone should be made to get the vaccine as a public health emergency. That may be your worldview. For some of us, your worldview is this. I should not be forced to get a vaccine as a, as a part of this because I have questions and reservations about it. However, it seems we aren't making allowance for various worldviews. And if someone does not align with my worldview, then we call them things like stupid or even worse. Where's the charity? Where's the love? How come it can't be as simple as allowing for people to have their view on this and making allowances for ourselves to protect from those? Love those who disagree with you anyway. I think the same could be said about another really hot topic that's going on in our world, and that is racial tension as well. Some of us believe that the only way to solve the racial tension in our world is to completely dismantle our social system as it is. We may align with the visions of Black Lives Matter or critical race theory proponents and other progressives in the journey towards a vision of social justice. Our goal is to strive towards equality, equity, no matter what the cost, and no matter what it does to the system around us. But standing on the other side are folks who believe in a fair and just society as well, just not aggression and hostility. Rather, their approach might be more along the lines of education, modification of laws in the criminal justice system, and the reinforcement of the nuclear family as the power to change systems around us. It's unfortunate that a moderate stance is seen as the enemy, while a too aggressive a stance is also seen as the enemy. If you don't agree with the progressive movement, you're a racist. If you don't agree with a moderate approach, you're a militant. And so we see tensions rising, battle lines being drawn, weapons of warfare being fashioned and stored up, even the dividing lines that we call our pews in our church. You know, the rhetoric of the church and our judgmentalism is a loud voice letting everyone know that we love to a point and that we have yet to really follow Jesus' command to love anyway. We have failed to love one another inside the walls of the church. We failed to love those outside the walls. We love if. We love if you vote the way we vote. We love if you behave the way we want you to behave. We love if you look like us, talk like us, and walk like us. We love if. While Jesus says, love anyway. And we need to learn this, my friends. We need to incorporate into our everyday walking around lives the way of Jesus, a love that is anyway. Will you strive today? Will you strive every day from now until eternity to learn to love anyway? Or will we continue to choose to omit it in certain ways from our lives? And will we kill the love of Jesus by choosing to not love any and every way possible? Let us pray. Gracious God, we confess that there are times in our lives when we are loving and there are times when we are not. In anger and frustration, we lash out against our family, our friends, a neighbor or even a perceived enemy. It is in these moments that we fail to love as you loved and we kill your example in our hearts and in our interactions. Yet in other times, we are moved by great compassion and concern for the world 
and our love is extended to others, even those considered unlovable. Remind us daily of your great love for us, and that while we were far and estranged from you, you sacrificed yourself in love so that we might be reconciled. Remind us daily of the call to love you, to love one another, to love our neighbor, and to even love our enemy. Give us the power of your spirit to pursue love, knowing and believing that it is the answer to all that ails the human community. And in the power of your loving name we pray. Amen. As we come this morning, we come not only to sing and to hear God's word proclaimed, we come to give our gifts today as well. For those of you at home, you can find the giving tab that is on our website or you can find it on Church World Media. And you can give your gifts there. For those of you present, we have an offering plate at the back of the sanctuary. You're more than welcome to leave your gifts there as you depart. But to each and every one of you, thank you so much for your loving faithfulness and your loving generosity.
Our hymn of sending forth this morning is We Are Marching in the Light of God, which you will see on page number 10 of your worship guide. I'd invite you as you're able to please stand and let us sing together. forth this morning, I want to remind you to take your worship guides home with you. As you come to your time of daily prayer, pray over the names that are on our prayer list. Take an opportunity to read the devotion that is included for this week as well. And then don't forget, take a moment to read through all the invitations they are for you. After the benediction, we'd invite you to take a moment to pause with us. If you'd like to be seated, you're more than welcome to listen to the postlude. And after that, you're welcome to join us for a few moments of fellowship in the rotunda area where we have some cookies and some coffee. 
Receive this benediction as you go forth today, this blessing. May you go in grace and peace. May you go knowing the blessings of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, for they are truly yours now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.